Our second scripture reading is from Luke's first chapter. It's the story of Zechariah, who I mentioned a moment ago, is the father of John the Baptizer. And this is on the occasion of John's birth. Friends, listen for the word of God. Then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hands of all who hate us, and thus he has shown mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we being rescued from the hands of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins by the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. This ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? God of grace, as we hear these jubilant, faithful words of a father with a newborn child, give us ears to hear your word to us today. Amen. A number of years ago, I went to an exhibit on Leonardo da Vinci's work at the Des Moines Science Center. And it was at the Science Center because it was an exhibit not so much about his artistic work as it was about his mechanical work. Because Leonardo was way ahead of his time in some respects of figuring out how to use the ancient tools of the screw and the pulley and the lever and all of that along with the new uh, found techniques of metallurgy and to make very practical uh, innovations out of them. I was a little shocked to see how many of his practical designs were actually devoted to making war when he himself felt like war making was one of our less admirable qualities. Um, but it also, uh, it also showed a side of him that just displayed how much of a genius he was. At one point there were these two documents that he allegedly had written with each hand simultaneously. And I tried this once. Uh, um, the left side was better than the right, I will tell you by a wide margin. Uh, but, but both of these were just really well done. Two different documents written at the same time. Now, the veracity of him actually doing that has been a little bit questioned, but it was pretty remarkable nonetheless. And, and of course they had some of his drawings as well. There was the Vitruvian Man. You've seen that picture of the man spread out like this with the perfect proportion of the body. And, and then some of his other drawings that were doodles, more or less, and some of them became paintings. You could see the evolution of them. Now, I came away with one impression that I'm going to share with you, but I'm going to give you the caveat that I am not an art critic, so you can take this with a grain of salt. But it did seem to me that Leonardo could not draw babies. I mean, he'd have a picture of a mother holding a child and she's looking adoringly at this child and you look at his face, all the babies... I, I said this to a person next to me who didn't seem to appreciate my artistic <laughs> taste, but I said, all these babies look like Larry Fine from the Three Stooges. <laughs> I mean, just imagine that. You got this adoring mother and you look down at the baby and it's like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Because, because... Leonardo was focused on the proportions of an adult face. And they're different from children. And certainly different from babies. So I came out of there with a great renewed appreciation for the Disney animators. <laughs> they have a better sense 
of how the baby's head is bigger relative to the body than an adult and how the babies have big eyes because our eye sockets don't really grow very much in our lifetime, but our noses do. So you don't want to put a schnoz on a baby or the, that's an ugly baby, right? And our ears get bigger as we go. And so, so when the Disney folk draw the babies, they've got these big, adorable eyes and big heads and teeny tiny cute noses and ears and um, they really do babies well. And I want you to think the difference between Leonardo's depiction of babies as shrink-sized hum- uh, grown-ups, ghastly though they tended to be, and the Disney view of babies, exaggerated perhaps, but bringing out all the cute qualities that make us adore them. Because I feel like, in some ways, when we hear Christmas carols and we set up the Christmas scenery, and, and, and we hear the Christmas story and we reenact the pageant and, and, and we read the books and stuff, what we're getting is the Disney animated version of Jesus, right? Uh, sweet little baby Jesus, meek and mild, lays his head. And when the cattle start making noise and wake him up, no crying he made, right? This is that idealized little baby Jesus surrounded by the world's cleanest barn animals and adoring people, you know, somehow making life in a manger look like a pretty fit place to live, right? And, and you've got that depiction of Jesus that, that means a lot. It means a whole lot because it, it enables us to focus in a way that has reverence and awe and kind of work our way past the elves and the reindeer and the snowmen and the big guy in the red suit and, and kind of find something sacred about the moment. So, so I'm, I'm all for this Disney animated depiction of Jesus that we get in the carols and, and, and the scenery. But when the scriptures talk about the birth of Christ, it's much more like a picture of Leonardo because they don't spend a whole lot of time adoring the baby. They spend a whole lot of time envisioning the Messiah. And that's what we get in the words of Zechariah today, in the text that we've read from Luke's Gospel. So Zechariah, as, as, as most of you know, he was John the Baptist's father, and he's described in the story as being from a great priestly stock. So his father and grandfather, folks like that, were all priests, and he's part of that uh, priestly stock. He's described as living in the hill country down in the southern part of the Palestinian area called Judea. And, um, and he's married to a woman named Elizabeth who really has a great pedigree. She's described as one of the daughters of Aaron. So her, her pedigree goes all the way back to Moses' brother who was one of the first priests. And, um, and so you've got... Uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, and they're described as being a faithful couple. Faithful, faithful. They were pious. They followed God's laws. They followed God's ways. And they're older. So now we're starting to hear an echo of an earlier story from centuries before because they're kind of like Abraham and Sarah because they're an older couple who have never had a child. And because of the patriarchy of the New Testament era, as well as the patriarchy of the Old Testament era, the blame was on Sarah for being barren. And in the New Testament, the blame is on Elizabeth, for she was barren, the the narrator says. And so you've got this older couple that are barren, very much like Abraham and Sarah were many, many years before. And when Luke begins to tell the Christmas story, he does not start with the angel's visit to Mary. He begins with the angel's visit to Zechariah. And he announces to Zechariah that he and his aged wife Elizabeth are in their later years going to have a child, very much like Abraham and Sarah. And that their child would be the forerunner to the Messiah who was coming. Later, uh, the stories are kind of interwoven. The angel will go to Mary, who's Elizabeth's cousin or distant relative of some sort. They just called all the extended family cousins back then. Um, She's Elizabeth's cousin, and Mary discovers that she's going to have a child. 
So, by the time you get to our reading, you've got this older couple, and Elizabeth's time has come. And she bears a child. And when she does, we've got this image of Zechariah. Now, here's what happened to him. When the angel came to visit Zechariah and tell him that his wife would have a child, even though he was from this great priestly stock and, and should have known better, he was actually at that moment in the temple. It was his turn. And he was in there lighting all the aromatic incense, which, which was a, a, a... I'm trying to think of the word for smelling. Uh, a smelly way to... Uh, uh, to experience the presence of God in the temple. And, and, and the smoke was a visual way of experiencing the presence of God in the temple. So he's in, this, he's in this really fine spiritual moment. And the angel comes and tells him, your prayers have been answered, you're going to have a child. And even though he comes from the great priestly pedigree, Zechariah has trouble believing it. And he doubts the angel's words. And the angel says, all right, just for that, you're going to be mute. And apparently, as the story unfolds, he's not just mute, but he also was deaf. Because they had to sign a question to him later. And, and sure enough, Zechariah becomes mute and deaf from that point on until the baby's born. And when the baby's born, Elizabeth says, his name's going to be John. Because that's what the angel told them. And everybody's like, what are you talking about? You don't know John people in your family. You can't name a baby after some other family. And they looked to Zechariah and they signed to him, what's the baby's name? And he asked for a tablet and he writes on there, his name is John. And when he writes that, when he accepts the word of the Lord that the angel had given to him, suddenly his tongue is loose and now he just won't shut up, right? <laughs> because he begins talking the passage that I read for you. So imagine this. He's got a newborn child here. And it would be so easy just to kind of be gazing at the child and to break forth in a song about how beautiful... Look, when my babies were born, all four of them, I just couldn't stop kissing them, couldn't stop getting a load of those big eyes and those cute little noses. And it was just everything. I couldn't stop smelling that sweet little baby's breath from breast milk, you know, just kind of a nice little aroma to it. And I just couldn't get enough of that. But here's Zechariah, and he's holding this child, and he says, you, child, you're going to be the forerunner of the prophet. You are going to turn the people's heart to their God. And this is a powerful thing, because now you have a parent who's kind of pushing through all the cute parts. And seeing the promise here. Because the promise is that when, when the Messiah comes, first there'll be a prophet to prepare us. Because you can't just haul off and start welcoming a Messiah. You have to be prepared. You have to turn your hearts. You have to return. You have to turn away. You have, there's all kinds of preparation that has to happen. And that's the role of John the Baptist. And Zechariah is looking at this brand new baby. And instead of just ooing and eyeing, he sees that moment when this child becomes the forerunner of the Messiah. And then he says something very interesting about the coming Messiah. And this is the part that I want to invite you to wrap your heart around as you prepare for the Messiah's coming this year. He says, the Messiah will come to us like the breaking dawn. This is very, very beautiful language. It is, in fact, the very same language that Matthew uses for the Magi saying they saw a star at its rising. So this is the light that comes at its rising. Martin Scorsese once said, that if you go to a matinee movie, and, and, and I've had this experience, he was absolutely right. If you go to a matinee movie, and you get in there and your eyes get adjusted to the movie theater, when you walk outside into the blazing sun, you can't see a thing, right? Because the sun is that bright. That's not the light that the Messiah is bringing. It's not a blinding light, but rather, Zechariah uses this language of a dawn, that's that breaking light over the horizon that only slowly begins 
to take away the darkness that shortens the shadows and gradually enables us to see. And then Zechariah reaches back and begins to evoke the language of Isaiah from that beautiful ninth chapter of Isaiah where Isaiah says, the people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who live in the land of deep darkness, on them the light has shined. That's the language that Zechariah begins to use. That the coming one, Mary's child, when, he, when that child comes into being, it will be like a dawning of a new day where everything is renewed and everything is refreshed. And it will be the dawning light on those who sit in darkness. It's the very loaded political phrase. It was political when Isaiah used it because his people were in exile. It was political when Zechariah used it because his people were living under the thumb of the Roman Empire. And he talks about this Messiah will come and bring light to those of us who sit in darkness. And then he uses what I think is one of the most arresting phrases in the whole Christmas genre. He will bring light to those who sit, Zechariah says, in the shadow of death. And we think about the 23rd Psalm, that phrase, of, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Because in some ways, all of our pain and all of our confusion and all of our frustrations are really signified by this enemy we call death. Because there's so many things we can overcome. We can overcome a little tiff with somebody. We can overcome a separation. We can overcome even a, a, a feud, as it were. But, but death is a kind of separation that has a finality to it that we've never been able to wrap our heads around. And the promise of this Messiah is a promise of light to those who sit in the shadow of death. Even that most difficult journey that often seems unending and brings us inconsolable grief, even in that journey, this promised one has come to bring us light. It's a powerful thing when Zechariah holds his newborn child and lifts him up proclaims him to be the forerunner to the Messiah and proclaims the Messiah as the one who brings the dawning light to those who sit in the shadow of death. And it does make us wonder, it makes us wonder why it was so hard for us to welcome Jesus. If he's that dawning light that, that, that brings hope to our hopeless situation. Why? It was so hard. We heard Julia read where someone says to Jesus, I want to follow you, and Jesus' response is, foxes have holes, birds of the air have their nests. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Not welcomed anywhere. And in fact, we put him to death. And it makes me wonder, why is it that we would be so reticent to receive someone who can bring a breaking dawn to the shadow of death. And I suppose in some way we're just a little too married to life as we already know it. We're a little too married to the way that our society has winners and losers and frankly most of us over here in the winner column and so we're okay with things. And we're a little too married to, to thinking of Jesus as a sweet little Disney animated baby or a Lord out in the sky somewhere, as opposed to that breaking dawn for whom we prepare by turning our hearts and becoming new people. I think we're a little too okay with letting Herod or Caesar Augustus or Quirinius, the governor of Syria, let them handle the business of business. And we'll make Jesus a spiritual entity over here. But that's not what happens when Christmas happens. Jesus is not born into the world to be adored as a cute little sweet baby or as a distant Lord who lives in a sphere over here called spirituality. When Christ comes into the world, you and I are called to welcome him by turning, turning from a world 
that is often rife with injustice and pain to a world where there is hope, where there is meaning, to a world where everyone has a home. And that's the world where we welcome the Christ. May God give us the grace to prepare our hearts to welcome that Christ. Amen.